Um, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for joining. So uh, my name is Yahya Ithawi. I'm a pediatrician and anatologist and um, also intensive care. And um, this is one of the uh, episodes of a series of uh, presentations. And I think this will be the first one on uh, uh, cardiovascular and heart. And today we'll be talking about medical management of heart failure. And I've selected this topic because of its importance. So let's start. So the objective is to do some introduction and uh, we'll talk about etiology and how to manage chronic versus acute heart failure. And what we will do post-surgery and we'll talk also about medical management of myocarditis and cardiomyopathy and we'll talk about other management and hopefully we can have some time to talk about um, outcome so uh, what is heart failure it's a clinical syndrome where the heart cannot pump um, and cannot uh, pump fluid and therefore cannot you know eject amount of blood uh, to meet the demand the metabolic demand of the body it, um, the cause of heart failure is, uh, of this failure. No, Aya, it's, there is a voice. Um, Aya, you have a problem. Okay, sorry for that. And uh, so it's either structural or functional. And structural heart, um, when there is a defect in the heart, either cause volume overload or pressure overload. And when there is functional, it's either impaired contractility uh, to pump or impaired relaxation to um, be filled with the blood. Um, so the main problem with the heart failure is ventricular dysfunction. And if the heart is structurally normal, then the most common cause is cardiomyopathy, and there are many types of cardiomyopathy. Um, but also, um, it can be uh, due to uh, uh, myocarditis, which is um, uh, infection, viral, bacterial, or even um, uh, sometimes associated with other diseases. Um, other uh, causes of structurally normal heart is myocardial infarction or ischemia. And there are many types like uh, anomalous uh, blood supply, uh, also Kawasaki or vasculitis, or if there is um, hyperlipidemia or other risk factor for uh, whether it's congenital or acquired to cause um, atherosclerosis, which is usually very uh, rare in children. Um, other causes of structurally normal heart, heart failure is arrhythmia, heart block, SVT, uh, VT and also exposure to toxin or, or drug uh, like anthracycline. And there are not other non-cardiac causes of structurally normal heart heart failure uh, like sepsis and comorbidity like heart failure. Um, non other non-cardiac causes like respiratory problems, um, infection like HIV or um, uh, uh, systemic diseases like SLE. Also, you'll have ventricular dysfunction, but structurally abnormal heart. These are called congenital heart disease. Uh, uh, there are com uh, um, complex congenital heart disease, or sometimes it's a single problem in the ventricle. Um, uh, most of these uh, diseases that ended up in heart failure needed um, uh, um, surgery. Other, um, so we talked about causes with ventricular dysfunction, but also we have uh, some causes with the preserved dysfunction. But the problem is with the blood coming or the blood leaving. So we have like volume overload uh, when we have a left to right shunt. As we know, uh, uh, right to left can co cause uh, cyanosis rather than, um, cyanosis rather than uh, of volume overload, but left to right shunt like ASD or VSD or uh, PDA 
uh, can cause volume or load. However, the cont contractility of the heart is okay. Um, other causes of, of uh, left to right is uh, aortopulmonary window or um, single ventricle. Uh, some of the uh, valvular insufficiency can cause uh, volume overload. <clears throat> Uh, non cardiac causes of volume overload, like arteriovenous malformation in the lung or in the brain. Also, when you get too much fluid, but also there is pressure overload, especially on the left side. So we have aortic stenosis or aortic corrugation or interrupted aortic arch or uh, systemic hypertension. All these causes um, cause um, uh, pressure overload on a, on a functionally normal uh, left ventricle. Um, also, the heart failure can be on the right side uh, due to uh, pulmonary stenosis or hypertension in a uh, functionally uh, normal uh, ventricle. Um, so this is very short, uh, but also there is a list of heart failure causes or etiology uh, depending on the age, uh, which I will not uh, list them because um, my presentation today is about management. So management in general divided into general and uh, pharmacological, and there is other management, but we call it non-pharmacological. Uh, I might also give list of them at the end of this talk. What is general uh, management? Is first to correct the ideology, second to uh, do uh, nutrition, and then to decide about the activity, and uh, what is the goal of the therapy depending on the patient, his family or her family, and also on the cause and how you approach the management, which one you start, how you categorize, and all these. These are all uh, general management. So what is reversible causes if patient has anemia, or hypertension, or renal failure, acidosis, obesity, malnutrition, uh, respiratory causes that cause uh, core pulmonary, thyroid diseases that can cause um, uh, 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 whether hypo or hyper that can cause heart failure. Um, so, if you correct this etiology, and also you can correct etiology by surgery, like in congenital heart disease, and sometimes without surgery, by intervention, uh, through an intervention, intervention cardiologist. Um, so, in addition to uh, treating or preventing or uh, 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 improving the etiology, we need to monitor the growth, uh, because uh, one of the main problem is um, uh, of, of heart failure is insufficient intake. Besides, there is increase in caloric requirement due to uh, metabolic demand. So uh, why we uh, there is an insufficiency of intake is because of tiredness. So the patient get tired, limit intake, and nobody take them. Remember, the normal caloric intake for optimal growth is 120. But in heart failure, you might need more than that. However, there is ratio between fluid and calories. And we know in heart failure, we have a fluid problem. So you need to balance fluid, uh, TFI, total fluid intake versus the caloric intake. And sometimes you reach, reach to up to uh, 160. However, when you concentrate the formula, uh, you will have also side effects. So you need to monitor that. And also you need to decide uh, whether to give the feed as a continuous or as, as a um, uh, or as intermittent or somewhere in between. So when we talked about intermittent feeding, we talked uh, or bolus feeding, we're talking about 20 mil, 20 minutes of feed uh, every two or every three hours. Uh, that's a, a bolus intermittent feeding. Can you, uh, can you please uh, mute your voice? And Uh, Dr. Sousen, can you please remove the doctor from your name and also write full your name? I will give you one minute and then I will remove your name. Uh, I'm going to text you too. Sorry for interruption. Um, so um, when we say bolus feed, we mean 
uh, 20 minutes of, of a feed every two or three hours, or we can go continuous, like let's say 10 mil per hour. Sometimes we can go in between, let's say feed over one hour uh, off for two hours, or feed over 30 minutes instead of 20 minutes, or 45 minutes, so you have to. Sometimes with all of that, you cannot do that, so you have to go with a surgery to do gastrostomy tube. Uh, as we talked earlier, uh, we have a, a preload problem in most of heart failure, so we have to restrict fluid. Also, we have to restrict uh, salt because the salt will shift the fluid from the tissue to the circulation to prevent overload. But at the same time, we need to increase the uh, calorie intake, uh, so we have to balance it. If we increase the calorie without fluid, you will have a concentrated formula, and then uh, you will have side effect of concentrated formula, uh, the viscosity and the electrolyte. Uh, Sometimes the patient arrives to you um, in already in in in, uh, in failure. Uh, also uh, arrive to you with very poor uh, weight gain. So in addition that the patient is unable to feed, you need to increase calories, but you have a fluid problem. Some patients they come to you already delayed and poor uh, uh, and have growth failure and they have poor weight gain, so you have to treat failure. And remember, when there is growth, uh, growth failure and non-optimal nutrition, the outcome is poor. And the, the, the growth failure and, and poor growth is very common in heart failure, sometimes reach up to quarter of, of heart failure patients. So you've corrected the ideology or you prevented it, or at least you uh, 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 minimize it, and then you've uh, given appropriate nutrition and treating the patient and making the patient uh, gain weight. And also you uh, corrected or helped the patient with the tool to do that. Now you need to promote um, healthy and normal lifestyle as much as we can. So the most important or one of the best goal of your management is the patient can do the routine daily life. So if the patient is less than one year, then probably the most important is the feeding, crying, playing, smiling, talking. Uh, but when the patient is eight years old, the, uh, he or she need to play with her peers. So, um, So it's very important to balance, to prevent sedentary life, to make the patient move, uh, to increase um, and encourage daily activity. However, uh, you have to minimize the activity, uh, especially for there is a risk factor for, um, for exercise, like patient uh, who has, for example, ischemia or abnormal coronary vessels or um, other factors that uh, may uh, aggravate heart failure or um, uh, worsen the heart failure when they uh, so encourage activity. You guys hear me? You guys hear me? Yes, we hear you. Good. Sorry about that. There was like interruption of the software. I'm not sure why. Okay. So, back. Um, so if you're lucky enough and the patient has no congenital heart disease and also 
um, he's more than seven years and you have the uh, facility and the uh, manpower to do uh, uh, child exercise capacity. That would be a wonderful uh, thing to do to assess the child ability to exercise. There is something called uh, uh, a cardiovascular rehabilitation program uh, that they think it improves the uh, exercise performance and improve the physical activity and uh, uh, make the patient has better quality of life. However, the evidence in children is controversial for this program. If you are luxury enough and you have a healthcare system that can provide this. How to manage? It depends on first on ideology and second on the severity. And therefore, you need a thorough assessment What is the most, the question is, I'm going to answer this question at the end of the presentation, if you don't mind. We'll talk about it. Um, um, so, um, uh, a thorough assessment of underlying cause of heart failure. And most of the guidelines for treatment of heart failure in most of institutes is depend on ASHLET uh, guideline. And uh, uh, sometimes you need to modify uh, these guidelines depending on the diagnosis and also your setting. But what is the goal? Why you manage heart failure? First, to relieve symptoms. Second, of course, to prevent mortality, but also to decrease morbidity. And uh, of course, morbidity means activity, but again, minimize admission to the hospital. The third aim of your treatment is to slow the progression of uh, uh, complete heart failure. And again, to improve, to improve survivor and to have a better uh, lifestyle. Because remember, treatment is not to give medication of heart failure. The treatment is, uh, of a child is to make him play and enjoy life like others. Otherwise, it won't be a life for a child because they will be depressed and uh, uh, there will be a huge psychological burden on them, especially if they are adolescent. The principle is divide your patient to two categories, stable, unstable. If unstable, admit to the hospital. And adequate therapy should be provided, even if the underlying etiology is not. Uh, 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 who's the uh, unstable patient? Those with congenital heart disease causes either uh, volume overload or pressure overload. However, if a patient have a structurally normal ventricle, but he is in failure, but his category is not unstable, you can manage him as, as an outpatient. Uh, so with congenital unstable uh, uh, heart disease, uh, the best is with the correction of the etiology, uh, whether by surgery or by intervention. And the purpose of medical therapy is for in this situation is to stabilize uh, the patient as a bridging uh, therapy between admission and the intervention, and also relieve symptom and uh, 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 hemodynamically stabilize the patient to be ready for the surgery or the intervention. So, unstable, stable. That's very important. Unstable admission, stable treat as outpatient. However, unstable, unstable, both of them need to be categorized. So the best way is to categorize the heart failure into stages. And we start with stage one, where uh, uh, include the patient is at risk of heart failure, whether it's congenital uh, or structurally normal, abnormal heart or structurally abnormal heart. So he's a, he or she is at risk, but she or he has normal cardiac function and size. And in this category, we do not treat treatment, but we need to treat the etiology. How? So we can correct anemia. We can treat hyper or hypothyroidism. We can treat uh, a respiratory or renal failure and any other cause of heart failure 
or uh, 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 um, even if not a cause, it's a predisposing factor. Stage B. Stage B, the patient is in failure. There is uh, evidence of failure, but the patient is asymptomatic. What does that mean? That the patient have a pre uh, uh, predisposing or uh, uh, factors of the uh, heart failure, or he is he or she is at risk of heart failure. And if you do functional assessment of the heart, uh, you will find that there is evidence of heart failure. For example, uh, you have uh, poor perfusion or you have uh, uh, decreased um, activity and notice or inability to exercise. And when you do echo, you might have functional uh, 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 problem, but the patient is not complaining in addition of presence of risk factor. What is the most common cause of congenital? I will answer the question at the end, but stage B, as I said, patient is at risk of heart failure. There is possibility or predisposing factor, that's one. Second, he is not complaining. Third, when you examine the patient or do assessment, you will find that the patient is in failure because the left ventricle is abnormal. How we diagnose that? You have poor perfusion, for example, decrease urine output. You have capillary, decreased capillary reflow. The growth is um, inappropriate. Patient cannot do exercise. However, the family did not notice that. He didn't complain. When you do hemodynamic assessment, you find the ventricular function global or by measurement is abnormal. So, the, so stage two, uh, stage two is patient asymptomatic. There is a predisposing factor, but the left ventricle is not functioning. So in stage one, we don't treat. In stage two, we, treat, we start medical treatment. And the first would be angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, or some of, um, if, if it's not possible or the side effect is high and you cannot use that, you can use angiotensin receptor blocker. Also in stage uh, B, uh, most of the pharmacological treatment, uh, if you remember, or uh, if you know, uh, the, that most of the, uh, the study is done in, in, in adult, and we extrapolate, extrapolate, the, uh, 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 extrapolate the guideline from adult because of the limited study of, 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 of heart failure in children. So um, beta blocker is also started to be used in stage B, uh, depending on study from the adult. However, uh, the study are limited because of most of the heart failure uh, uh, treated by beta blockers is because of ischemic heart disease and ischemic heart disease is very rare in children. So stage B, normal assessment heart, asymptomatic but risk factor. Stage B, risk factor, asymptomatic but assessment is abnormal. And stage C, stage C, there is symptom. Patient at some point, of his or her life complained from uh, symptoms of heart failure, okay? Or there is structural or functional heart disease. Remember, not assessment, because in stage B, there is no structural or functional heart problem, but assessment of the heart is abnormal. Again, in stage C, you initiate treatment with angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. And if you cannot take it because of side effect, you give angiotensin receptor blocker. However, in stitch C, um, it's also the evidence of giving beta blocker is uh, depending on adult. However, the most important point of differentiating in treatment of stage B from C is using the diuretics. And if the quality of life is not improve, improved, you need to start digoxin. I know most of people cause uh, uses digitalization, uh, but that is unnecessary. And the digoxin was a very common drug uh, in 1990, but this, because of the side effect, 
and because the study showed that uh, quality of life and mortality is not improved with using digoxin. So now it's become the fourth or even the fifth uh, choice in the list in order of importance. In stage D, there is end stage heart failure. That a patient, when you give oral medication, is not responding. Or the patient is unstable. What we do with this patient, of course, you admit. And you give inotropes. The inotropes can be dobutamine, can be melurinone, can be uh, 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 catecholamines. It depends. So you need to admit, you give IV inotropes, IV diuretics. And sometimes you need non-pharmacological uh, treatment like non-invasive ventilation or cardiac resynchronization therapy. And if somebody asks about what is that, it's a way to improve the propagation of the conduction system. All of you guys know when there is heart failure, especially when there is increased mass in the heart, or uh, when there is a, a delay in the conduction, uh, uh, the heart failure is, is, is because of the delay or the long period from the senior adrenal node automaticity to the reach to the time the, uh, the, the uh, propagation reach the, the muscle is short and that's why the function become uh, uh, improper example of uh, uh, left bundle branch block. So what that does you put a pacing uh, 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 in the area that has, uh, prolonged propagation or receive the message late from the serial node and you synchronize it with the synotrium node to improve contractility or what we call it cardiac resynchronization therapy. Also you might, the patient will be in complete failure. You have a respiratory uh, uh, failure, you have uh, hypoventilation, high CO2 and you have uh, uh, deoxygenation as uh, hypoxemia. So you might need uh, 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 mechanical ventilation and sometimes you need up to high frequency ventilation and also you might need to do a heart implant and as a, a cure therapy. Uh, remember what about right side heart failure same state we'll talk about that but in general, yes. In general, yes. When you have a failure of the right side of the heart, it will go back from to the lung and to the uh, left side. So yes, the treatment is different because treatment depends on the symptom and assessment of function. So in general, yes. Uh, remember, uh, uh, stage C and stage D, they are not far from each other. So they can move step up and step down. So this is a, a short list of, uh, we'll answer the questions at the end of the presentation, uh, but we will be talking about drug by drug. So uh, again, we have stage A and B, and this is a list of what we should do with each stage and what is the um, assessment look like. So you have to review that, but in general, you have normal assessment in stage A and abnormal assessment in stage B. Both of them are asymptomatic and structurally normal heart. In stage C and, and D, they are um, also interchange, but in stage uh, C, you have uh, uh, an etiology, uh, abnormal structure or function of the heart, and abnormal assessment. In stage B, it's patient is unstable. Patient is not responding to of to oral treatment, and therefore you need to admit. Now we will talk um, and we'll answer some of your question about when and how to use uh, medications. How we stay, we we and, and, and if you remember and if you are old enough to know in 1990s and 1980s, the treatment is totally different because we select the medication depending on efficacy. And most of medication, uh, we are extrapolating from adult study because of the limit 
uh, studies of heart failure uh, because of, of, of limited incidence comparing to the adult and also because of difficulty in conducting the studies. The other is uh, by, uh, when we give the medication, we observe the uh, uh, left ventricular uh, function. And uh, uh, when we have that left ventricular uh, uh, dysfunction, we have a compensation or triggering uh, corrective uh, or compensating uh, measures done by the body. These are sympathetic nervous system stimulation, stimulation of renin and geotensin system. Uh, uh, and these both initially are compensatory, but uh, when uh, they become long enough, uh, uh, they become uh, maladaptive and they contribute further to deterioration of the uh, uh, lung function, uh, of, sorry, of the, of the uh, heart function of the left ventricle. And what will happen, the body will reprogram uh, itself uh, about the new uh, ability of the heart. This is what we call it remodeling. And with time, you will have worsening of the heart failure. So uh, the drug or medication either block the neurohormonal activation like beta blocker and angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, or drug that relieves symptoms like diuretics, digoxin. And therefore, uh, digoxin is not in use because it's not remodeling and it causes only relief of symptoms. However, it has higher side effect than diuretics and angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. If the side effect is high for angiotensin, then use angiotensin uh, receptor blockers. So we'll start with the angiotensin uh, inhibitors, and they are always accepted as a first stage treatment of stage B and stage C heart failure. However, it's very important to monitor the, heart, the blood pressure, especially in the first few days. And um, um, if, if you want to give them IV, uh, or if you think that the patient follow-up is not great, then probably you need admission. In addition, you need to monitor the renal function because they can cause deterioration of renal function and the deterioration of renal function and blood pressure deterioration are very important in neonates. So what they do is they inhibit the angiotensin type 2. And uh, as we know, the angiotensin type 2 is very important vasoconstrictor. So they cause vasodilatation, but also they promote uh, muscle cell uh, hyperatrophy. Uh, they also inhibit uh, fibrosis and also they inhibit the aldosterone. So the use of them, uh, in addition to the uh, beta blockers and uh, angiotensin receptor blocker and aldosterone antagonist, they prolong uh, the patient life. Uh, and, and, and again, these evidence are indirect from adult studies. So what is renin angiotensin aldosterone inhibitor does? Uh, the renin angiotensin uh, aldosterone activate the, um, um, this system and it goes, uh, uh, it ends with angiotensin 2 that causes vasoconstriction, but also it increases sympathetic tone. So therefore, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and blockers decrease afterload because of causing vasodilatation, but also promote ventricular remodeling due to increase a drop in the sympathetic tone. And they're very good for long-term benefits. Therefore, it reduces the afterload, it improves the cardiac function and uh, uh, in long-term, uh, uh, in over long term, it causes uh, cardiac remodeling. The most common of these drugs are the enalapril. So uh, it's used for hypertension, but also it can be used with hypertension with the proteinuria and nephrotic syndrome uh, because they have the least effect on that uh, uh, and compared to other angiotensin converting inhibitors. The initial dose is 0.1 mic uh, milligram per kg per day. You divide it up to, sometimes you can divide up to three doses, but most of us divide it in two doses. 
And remember, if you need more, you should not increase it uh, unless two weeks pass. The maximum is 0.5 milligram per day, but the mean usually it's 0.3. But some of the individual uh, with observation, uh, a dose of 0.9 have been reported. Other type of uh, uh, angiotensin converting in, in, uh, in addition, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor in addition to enalopril are uh, um, many. I don't want to list them, but they are uh, captopril, enazepril, many, many types. You don't need to memorize them. If you have one, uh, you need to uh, know the dose or, or review the dose for uh, only the one that you use. But there are no major, there are major difference here and there, but most of common they share same effect and same side effect. What about the angiotensin receptor blockers? Usually they are second line for angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor when there is side effect. And the side effect of the uh, angiotensin are cough and angioedema, also a renal problem. They have almost the same effect of angiotensin comparing, uh, converting enzyme inhibitor and their study in adult compared the, uh, the uh, IRP uh, with the enalopril, and they found it's comparable. The other drug is diuretics. It promotes decreased preload because it causes uh, natriuresis and then causes diuresis. So it relieves the symptom. The most common, uh, 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 with, we use it in symptomatic heart failure to improve the symptom. So they are unnecessary, therefore, in stage one A and B because there is no symptom. So they are either loop diuretics or thiazide or aldosterone antagonist. The most common, uh, the one they use is, uh, of course they inhibit uh, sodium and chloride reabsorption at thick part of ascending limb of lobe of Hindley. And the most common is the fluorosemide, but also the omitinide on tur and turosemide, uh, but they are very high dose and they are unreliable because you need to give very low dose. What is the side effect? It's electrolyte abnormality, hyponatremia, hypochloremia, uh, hypokalemia, but also they can cause renal problem, they can cause metabolic acidosis, um, uh, a metabolic alkalosis or contracted alko uh, uh, alkalosis, um, long-term complication, calcification of kidney, but also they can cause, uh, in addition to renal problem, they can cause uh, hearing problems, especially with IV high doses. Thiazide, it's inhibitory. Now again, the dose of uh, furosemide, if you guys want to do it, an oral and IV, it's one milligram per kg. You can go down to 0.5 milligram per kg per dose. You can give it as a scheduled dose, but also you can give it as, as an infusion in stage C and D. And of course, when you decide to give infusion, if the uh, child is unresponsive and you need a nephrology consultation. Uh, what about thiazide? It's, they are not, they don't work at the uh, lobophily. And thiazides work on convoluted tubule of kidney. And they are the second line and they need it for long term. And usually after we give a dose of, uh, or a trial of loop diuretics. The most commonly is chlorothiazide, but also we have the hydrochlorothiazide and metolazone. And remember, thiazide is a like diuretics, it's only for symptomatic treatment. Aldosterone, same problem, same, but they conserve potassium. So either use diuretics and supply potassium or use aldosterone uh, antagonist because the side effect, or maybe it's a benefit, is hyperkalemia. And, uh, but the other side is gynecomastia. So be careful, especially in male adolescent, that they prefer to die, some of them, than having a big breast. So you have to be careful when you start. The digoxin, they are very commonly used. They are preferred by many people. However, they are not important. Because remember, they are not remodeler. They only relieve symptoms. And we can relieve symptoms with diuretics. And the side effect of diuretics is way less than the side effect of digoxin. As you know, the uh, uh, side effect on the vision, the side effect on the heart and the toxicity. 
So only use an asymptomatic heart failure, remember that. And they should be not giving never uh, prior the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor and diuretics. So they can provide relief of symptom. And uh, we should monitor the dose because of, of toxicity and the trough level uh, should be somewhere between 0.5 to 0.9 and nanogram per mil. And again, the side effect uh, uh, is an arrhythmia. However, the approach now the change and we should use a low dose. And because of that, I sent everybody a copy of the doses, low dose, I personally do not prefer digitalization. I go with maintenance dose and not digitalization because I can relieve symptoms. We used to give uh, digitalization, the reason because we thought actually the heart, the dioxin improve, uh, uh, and cause improve the heart failure, but it does not. It's only improve the symptom. And you can improve the system, symptom with heart failure, with diuretics and then geocognitin converting enzyme. But if they are not working, you can add digoxin. And always uh, depend on the new uh, dosing system, and it should be very low dose. Um, as I, I again, as I said previously, it was very commonly used, but they found it does not decrease mortality, it does not decrease hospitalization, and it has positive inotropic effect by affecting sodium potassium ATPase system and therefore it increased intracellular calcium and improved contractility. But it has negative chronotropic effect because it slows the conduction and the automaticity and also has some vagotonic property. And therefore it counter effect the uh, uh, sympathetic nervous system. But remember the, that the uh, uh, sympathetic nervous system uh, uh, function at the beginning is, is a compensation and therefore, you, know, you don't need to abort it. So it's not good drug for acute heart failure uh, because uh, you need to uh, block or abort the vigodenic property on long term when they, these sympathetic response become maladaptive. And again, it should be the third level or there or the fourth uh, 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 level in the rank of treatment. Now we're talking about beta blockers. And again, usually beta blockers is remodeler. So you cannot use them in acute heart failure most of time. And they are, can be used in stage B. Stage A, we don't need, but we can stay, use stage B. Uh, and we can add it to stage uh, C and D as a fourth line. Uh, use can be used in, in stable stage uh, C heart failure, but not in unstable patient. So when you have acute decompensation, you should not use, and if they are on board, you should stop them. Uh, the most important is right now is carvidilol and metoprolol. But also there is another drug called isoprolol that I prefer it in neonate because it's a very short acting drug. And you can give it as infusion in patient with hypertension and heart failure. Uh, metopropo is preferred uh, when you have a very frequent ventricular ectopic rhythm. And carvidilol usually initiated at very low dose. So if you calculate your dose at, at, at eight milligram, then you should start with one milligram. So usually the dose is 0.05 milligram per kg per dose, giving uh, orally over two days and then increase it, uh, I mean, give it twice per day and then increase the dose every two weeks. And usually the increment is doubling the dose. And you look for the side effect, which is the dizziness, the fatigue, the hypotension, the bradyarrhythmia, and bronchospasm, and other side effect. Metoprolol, you start at 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.1, uh, more than the uh, carvidilol, and again, almost same approach of increment. And remember, the uh, beta blockers inhibit or promote the maladaptive. 
a response from the uh, 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 sympathetic nervous system. That's very important. Now. Therefore, they cause remodeling and they improve life. They stop or they decrease mortality and improve quality of life. They are not like the digoxin. Remember that. Digoxin, I know people use it, but digoxin is for symptomatic management. Studies are very limited. It's all in adults. So we are extrapolating data from adult, where we know beta blocker improve because they cause remodeling and improve left ventricular function. Pulmonary vasodilators is another drug that can be used, especially if you have a pulmonary hypertension. I'm not gonna go with the list of them because they are very long. Example are many. Uh, that can be used in, in pulmonary hypertension, like sildenafil, like posentam, like many other drugs, uh, melrinone. What we would do if we have advanced heart failure, we have stage C or D, admit IV diuretics, IV inotropes. Inotropes is used in a setting of low cardiac output whether it's left or right. And also we use in acute exacerbation when there is comorbidity. We use it to improve cardiac output and we improve it to stabilize the patient as a gap if we are planning to uh, heart transplant. It increases intracellular I, um, CIMP and also it improve, uh, increase the production of catecholamines. And it's most of them are phosphodiesterase inhibitor, therefore they are vasoconstrictor and also they cause, uh, uh, they, they cause low blood pressure, improve in blood pressure, sorry, and also sometimes they cause some diuresis. Example of, uh, of them are catecholamines uh, that um, improve the, uh, of, uh, an example of the inotropes, uh, they are sympathomimetic stimulation stimulators, and the most important is dopamine. And dopamine is more alpha uh, type two, and it's more cause vasoconstriction, but in low dose cause vasodilation, especially renal. And the doses start from five mic per kg per minute, and we've increased it. Before we used to reach to twenty, but right now we rarely go above ten because of this vasoconstrictor side effect. So we reach 10, and then we add it to IV melrinone. However, remember that melrinone causes hypotension. So you need to give boluses before you add melrinone. If uh, still globally the function of the heart is not functioning well, then you use a dobutamine. If you have a heart problem and, 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 and systemic problem, you might think of norepinephrine. But if you have a heart problem, uh, contractility problem, you might think of epinephrine. Um, if you have a fluid problem, you might add vasopressin. Over the vasopressin and, and also norepinephrine, they cause hyponatremia and uh, 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 accumulation of fluid. So you need to restrict fluid and also improve your uh, sodium, uh, mainly by restricting, but uh, you might need to treat that hyponatremia when you add this combination. When you start to give ketamine, uh, catecholamine, sorry, and you have advanced heart failure, mostly you need an arterial line and a central line to make sure that you are safely administering this medication because most of them they cause problem when they admit it in a peripheral IV. And also you need to monitor the central pressure and you need frequent blood sampling. When you treat with inotropes, one of the purpose is to improve contractility, but the most important is your end organ perfection. So you need to measure your urine output, your perfusion, like capillary refill, 
you need to measure your lack, uh, uh, lactate and also you need to measure your com uh, oxygen consumption by measuring the arterial blood gas and venous blood gas and compare. Melirinone is fast phosphodiesterase inhibitor. It's very good for pulmonary hypertension, but remember it causes hypotension. It's increased contractility and decrease after low. So you need to give boluses sometime when to use it. I personally start with 0.25 and then increase it to 0.5 and then 0.75. And I monitor the cardiac output and, and I monitor the blood pressure during that. And usually I add it when I already start dopamine and dopamine. And of course, nilirinone is inadmitted uh, in hospitalized patient. And uh, nasiturite, I never used it. I don't know, I've read about it, but I never used it in my life. So we've talked about pharmacology, oral therapy, and we've talked what we do when we admit patient pharmacologically. But sometimes when you admit patient, you need to give other non-pharmacological therapy. For example, non-invasive ventilation, whether oxygen or high frequency nasal ventilation or CPAP or advanced CPAP. We talked about cardiac resynchronization therapy when you have a conduction problem. So you do pacing and you correlate or you you uh, time your pacing with your um, um, sinoatrial node, but also you might need something called mechanical circulatory uh, support like ECMO. But sometimes we, we now it's, it's, it's in the, the interventional cardiologists do uh, ventricular uh, assisted device, which is a device not only not like the uh, resynchronization therapy is promoting uh, uh, automaticity of uh, delayed conducting system, but it causes contraction. So it helps the, the ventricle to contract. And if that does not help, then you're, you, you are reaching to a point with heart transplant. Uh, we need also to talk, the time will not be, um, uh, will not be enough, but we need to know, talk about non-invasive ventilation and invasive ventilation and heart failure. It needs a, um, a separate lecture. And when you have sudden cardiac death, what you should do? And what is how you manage the long-term uh, health problem, like mechanical circulatory support, monitoring of growth, monitoring of cardiac function, uh, treatment of complications, exercise, when to give antibiotic, when you have structural heart disease, how to plan the cardiac surgery, and if the patient needs trouble, what you do. These need to be also discussed, but the time will not be limited because the topic today is about pharmacology. Outcome variable. Mortality is about 10%. Median admission days is about six days in each admission. There are independent risk factors for mortality in addition to the heart failure, whether it's a structural or not normal, non normal structure. Like if there is a comorbid respiratory or renal problem, or if the patient comes in stage C, or if you have a neuromuscular disease like Duchenne muscular dystrophy, or you have left ventricular shortening fraction abnormal. Remember myocarditis? No patient with viral myocarditis have a good survival. After heart transplant, depend on the age. So the younger patient with transport have a better prognosis. The mortality is very high after the transplant and decrease with time. Outcome, we said in, in transplant, it depends on the age. So the younger, the better. Also the age of the donor, the older, the worse. Um, and the time from transplant to reperfusion effect. 
if the pre-transplant renal function is comorbid, comorbidity, and it's also poor when the patient needs ECMO and ventilator support during transplant. Also, it's affected by the cardiac disease. Uh, congenital heart disease usually high compared to non-congenital uh, heart problem. Uh, the outcome also affected by the retrotransplant and uh, also the um, with the transplant it's also affected by the volume of the transplant of the center so the more transplant that center do the better is the prognosis and i am done um, i'm happy to answer questions